happen in the wake of what's going on. People can donate money in small increments to a project which they believe has moral and ethical value and that is good for the community. People who embrace 3D printing are finding new uses for the emerging technology. You can go anywhere around the world. And what is happening is organizations, corporations, government, and people are establishing bold, short-term and long-term goals, goals. And what that does is that increases the velocity of change that you have to cope with, which means that you need to innovate faster. You need to change faster. You need to do things faster in order to keep up. Do you know why I call this attribute, this capability, corporate agility? What is your corporate agility? How quickly can you, re can you react? How quickly, when there is some new crisis which emerges, which, which requires some pretty innovative solutions to deal with, how quickly can you pull together a global team of experts in a particular area to deal with that new reality? How quickly would a new market opportunity emerges? and there's a very small window by which you might be able to capitalize upon it. How quickly can you scale? How quickly can you share ideas? How quickly can you scan throughout the organization to do a poll of who's got ideas on how we can quickly scale into this new marketplace? Corporate agility is a key foundation of innovation. If, if you can become a more agile organization, that's how you succeed in the high-velocity economy. So we've heard what Jim said about corporate agility. But what exactly are agile teams? And how are they structured? So let's look at a typical organization built like a machine. Usually has a pyramid structure with a top-down hierarchy. Yes, we are aware of the bureaucracy that exists and they usually have teams that are focused on detailed instructions. But usually, they work in silos. But the agile organization is totally different. Leadership is at the center and ensures direction and also enables action. In the agile organization, boxes and lines are less important because the focus is on action and delivery. They can make changes quick and they're very flexible with resources. And these teams are built around end-to-end -end accountability, just like an organism is built. You're probably sitting there wondering, but how does this work? Let us share with you eight steps that organizations take in structuring agile teams. Number one, there is a clear and flat structure. The focus really is on the performance group that shares a common mission. While within this group, you have teams that can either be increased in terms of number or reduced based on the changing business needs. Number two, there are clear, accountable roles. The focus is on getting the work done. Rather than waste time or energy on unclear or duplicated roles or waiting for manager's approvals. Like I said, the focus is getting the job done. Number three, hands-on governance exists. This just means that the teams responsible for the execution are empowered to make decisions. Yes, there's an overall system that provides guidance, but then these teams are empowered to deliver. Number four, there are robust communities of practice. Basically, this means that any knowledge that is obtained during the execution or implementation of the project is passed on and constantly shared so that people can retain the critical knowledge within those teams even though the composition of the teams may change. Number five, they have active partnerships and ecosystems which they leverage to generate new products, services and solutions. In other words, they are connected. Number six, 
They work in open physical and virtual environments. Now, wouldn't you just want to work in a space like this? This helps them foster transparency, communication, and collaboration across teams, across units, across performance groups, and across the organization. Number seven, they work in fit for purpose accountable cells. And these cells, interestingly, actually have greater autonomy and accountability and usually consist of multiple disciplines while they focus on specific value creating opportunities. And last but not the least, they adapt to change in a fast manner. That is what corporate agility is about. They accept uncertainty as a given and then they are focused on delivery, quick to change and then they welcome change at any stage of a given project cycle because the end is clear they must deliver. These are some of the most advanced agile teams in the world. Now ask yourself, is your company on this list? If your company is not on this list, don't be alarmed, we got you covered. We looked at one of these super agile companies and spoke to our friend called you and asked him a simple question. How does Amazon stay agile? I think we, we've we structured uh, organizationally to try to enable agility. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is uh, the notion of what we call two pizza teams. And these are what we call our technical teams. Uh, and the idea came from uh, that they were small enough that you could feed them with two pizzas. Uh, and this is somewhat funny because uh, engineers generally eat a lot of pizza. Uh, and the idea that you could feed a team of six to 10 engineers uh, on two pizzas uh, is a little bit uh, funny. But, uh, but the idea is that these uh, Small teams are independent and they own a fully uh, functional area and they have the resources embedded within them to have full ownership. So they own every function from uh, engineering to testing to project management, product management, and we try to embed all those resources on that single team and make them single threaded with a single owner and give them a very tight charter and mission so they can run as fast as possible and try not to worry too much about what else is going on at the company uh, because they're decoupled as much as possible based on what they own. Um, and this notion has existed the entire time I've been at Amazon, uh, which is 13 years. And it's funny because I think that the culture at that individual team level has changed very little in that 13 year period that I've been here uh, because I think that that, uh, that culture of having small independent teams actually is self-reinforcing from a culture perspective and I think it's helped us scale dramatically over that time. Thanks Lou, I knew we could count on you. Now guys, to give you an idea of scalability and the scale that Lou was talking about, in 1994 Amazon was an online bookstore, that's it, but because of corporate agility Let's give you an idea of what an Amazon warehouse looks like today. Don't fall off your seats. Fantastic, truly remarkable. As a philosophy, corporate agility has very few tangible downsides because it relies on being applied for the right reasons, at the right places, and in the right way. Once it's done well, it delivers tremendous impact. But if it's misused, it can trigger disruption and productivity loss on a massive scale. So here are some limitations and things to look out for. For starters, corporate agility can prove difficult to get right. I mean, it was that easy, everyone will be doing it, right? So organizations in a bid to get it right, ironically, 
make the first fundamental mistake. They copy and paste. No, don't do it. Don't copy and paste. It doesn't work. Corporate agility principles are universal, yes. But then in application, it depends on the work that is being targeted and the constitution of the team that is involved. So emulating another team's philosophy or agility application on your own team, it's not going to work. Number two, you need to understand that you have to build capacity. Let's not kid ourselves. Because corporate agility succeeds when the people, the teams, and the leaders possess the right skills and mindsets. And oftentimes, these must be strengthened. Another hurdle is this. Don't stay partially agile. Why would you want to stay partially agile? Organizations start on the journey towards corporate agility with an agile team. And then they leave the rest of the organization as is. It's not going to work. To achieve full benefits, agility should be executed end to end. And then there's the short term buyers. Because agile teams are focused on delivering a particular uh, product or service or solution, they also need to be aware that there are existing solutions that need to be optimized. There's this strong possibility of them leaving the optimization of existing solutions and focusing solely on new features. That's a short-term bias and mindset that you need to be aware of. There are also some underestimated costs of people and tools that organizations seem to be unaware of. There is a productivity loss during the learning curve. It's a new process. Expectedly, statistics reveal that the productivity loss during the learning curve is about 14%. But when the agile teams conquer the learning curve, they see productivity boosts to about 27% versus traditional teams. So the medium to long-term view, it makes sense. There's also significant leadership time spent. Senior leadership must spend enough time showing their commitment to developing this agile methodology. And you must also support this application. And this usually be done through communication and role modeling the agile behaviors. Once the leadership demonstrates this, it's easier to implement it and to embed it across the organization. So leadership must definitely be committed to this. Then there is the labor and talent impact. And this usually happens in three ways. First, you may actually lose some key employees. Why? They're not interested in your new agile way of working and that's it. You can't keep them down. Secondly, you may need to employ temporary capabilities that would help put the new system in place. Why? Because you just don't have those capabilities in house yet. And then number three, your talent management systems and approaches may need to be tweaked a little or even changed or sometimes totally overhauled to accommodate the new system and way of working. And then lastly, particularly for heavily tech-dependent companies, sometimes there's a significant improvement of technology infrastructure that may be required to be put up front to enable the agile way of working. We believe you now have a broader view of what agility means in teams and some of the limitations that you need to be aware of. So to wrap this up real nice, we're going to leave you with four simple steps to help you achieve success in growing agile. Number one, set a baseline. You need to identify where you are. What's your starting point? How agile is the company? Is it very inflexible? Is it partially agile or very agile? Where are you starting from? That's it. Then secondly, you need to identify what needs to improve. You need to analyze which areas need to improve. So this gives you an idea of the quantum of change that is required. It gives you an idea of the kind of journey you're about to embark on. Thirdly, you need to look over the feds. Compare with industry benchmarks. How are our peers doing? Now understand, this is not about copying and pasting. You're just trying to be aware of what's happening around you. Most agile companies focus on four main areas at the very least for starters. However, this is no restriction on how far you can go. They focus on values and principles, operating architecture, talent, and the budgeting cycles. And then lastly, but definitely not the least, there must be strong leadership support. It is imperative that the organization demonstrates strong leadership support for the journey towards corporate agility because it must always be visible at all times and must be sustained till the very end of the execution. So, what are you waiting for? Go Agile and evolve your business.